Hello, my name is Natalia Sheiko and uh, I'm representing Medical University of Warsaw. And I would like to give you an overview of neuropsychiatric aspects of um, Huntington's disease. So um, I have no conflicts of interest regarding this presentation. And uh, well, uh, just a little bit of uh, background uh, at the beginning. As you know, um, there are well, a lot of um, variety of uh, common symptoms in uh, Huntington's disease, in particular cognitive decline, mood swings, involuntary movements, uh, hallucinations, speech difficulties, as well as behavioral and personality changes. And it is pretty remarkable that already in 19th century, uh, when Huntington's disease was first described, uh, also uh, these neuropsychiatric aspects were mentioned in particular, for example, sexual uh, inhibition. So, and we also know that um, well, different uh, neuropsychiatric aspects uh, occur at different stages of Huntington's disease. For example, at early stage, um, more typical is apathy um, and generally mood changes, um, whereas um, in the middle stage, more typical is disinhibition or cognitive impairment. And for a later stage, um, more typical is dementia, hallucinations, and delusions. So you can see that, um, well, this is this stays in line also with the, the, the stages, moderate stages of Huntington's disease in general. So when it comes to the prevalence of uh, different um, neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms in Huntington's disease, in symptomatic HD patients, it is estimated that up to 73 or but up to 98% of HD patients will have a major psychiatric disorder or psychiatric symptoms. Um, but um, not all symptoms are experienced by all patients, obviously. And also it is important that these symptoms can wax and wane with time, as I mentioned before. And what is also very important is that there is no correlation between the presence of psychiatric symptoms and CAG repeats uh, size um, found whatsoever. So this is very important um, aspect that we have to remember about. Um, well, and uh, coming uh, already to, to this um, variety of symptoms that I mentioned at the beginning, you can see that this includes not only uh, mood changes, so for example, apathy, depression, and of course, related to the suicidal ideation. Uh, but another important aspect is obviously dementia, cognitive decline, uh, but also psychosis, mania, and OCD, as well as disturbance of sleep-wake cycle, unawareness and anosognosia, and disinhibition. And um, first of all, as I mentioned before, already at early stages, of Huntington disease, uh, there are not only subtle motor symptoms, but also some subtle neuropsychiatric changes, for example, cognitive symptoms or behavioral symptoms. And in presymptomatic HD gene carriers, there is a great greater prevalence of psychiatric symptoms, which is denominated the behavioral and psychological symptoms of HD, uh, PPSHD. And these are normally affective disturbances, which can precede the classical motor symptoms by even a decade. And of course, the other important um, cluster of symptoms are cognitive changes. So while well, coming to the cognitive changes, um, cognitive symptoms in uh, Huntington disease, they primarily reflect a form of subcortical dementia. And these memory deficits, uh, psychomotor slowing and impairment in executive, per perceptual and spatial skills. And these memory problems arise from uh, an efficient memory strategy for acquiring and retrieving memories rather than a primary disorder of retention and thus may reflect executive dysfunction. And what is important with progression also, of course, the ability to communicate of the patients also diminishes. Well, uh, and uh, this is obviously related to the problems of speech, which in, of course include dysartia with poor articulation and slurring of words, as well as so slow production of words for speech initiation and difficulty in organizing thoughts. So these are 
Mainly cognitive changes are obviously related also to the production of language and uh, speech disturbances. And uh, well, at this point, it, uh, it is also important to compare uh, Huntington's disease with Alzheimer's disease. Um, as you can see, there are some distinctive features, for example, um, that uh, speed of processing generally uh, is um, accurate in Huntington's disease and uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease, it's often inaccurate. Uh, similarly, speech output um, in Huntington's disease is large or slow, but accurate. But on the other hand, in Alzheimer's disease, it's normal rate and clarity, but uh, it's often inaccurate. Uh, and also, as you can see, that there is a difference when it comes to learning of the new information, because in Huntington's disease, it's, it is organized and slow, but they can learn. But in Alzheimer's disease, there is, um, of course, main symptom is rapid forgetting, and they cannot store information whatsoever. Uh, and there are also some other differences when it comes to pre-recall and motor memory. Uh, but uh, as you can see here, um, but this is already un not under the scope of this presentation. Um, and um, it is also important to bear in mind that uh, there is a difference uh, when it comes to the profile of cognitive changes between so-called juvenile Huntington disease and adult Huntington disease. So um, as you probably heard in previous presentations, juvenile Huntington disease is um, characterized by the onset uh, that is earlier than 20 years old. Um, and um, in this case, as you can see, the most uh, typical cognitive changes uh, are deterioration in school performance, obviously, because they are, these are young people or even children, and also ADHD-like symptoms. This is very, could be very confusing and challenging for the clinician. Uh, and problems with language regression or cognitive decline, which in includes subcortical dementia that I mentioned before but also behavioral changes and agitation. And this is the differs from the profile of patients with adult Huntington disease who only have cognitive decline and symptoms of subcortical dementia. So as you can see here, the profile of cognitive changes is more robust in a young patient actually. And sometimes it's difficult to differentiate, for example, with uh, ADHD in adults or even adolescents. Uh, and well, um, when it comes to uh, the cognitive um, uh, changes in Huntington's disease, as I mentioned, there is, there is a change over time, uh, usually with progression, obviously the same as for motor symptoms, the same goes uh, for the, the same rule goes for, for the cognitive symptoms. When it comes to the apathy, the estimated prevalence of apathy is between, well, it actually depends on the study but it's before 38 and 76%. And apathy has been identified as a robust predictor of phenoconversional disease progression, as well as closely linked to the global and executive cognitive performance. Uh, apathy typically manifests as indifference and reduced activity or lethargy. And obviously the symptoms of Apathy can be mistaken for depression, as both can present with diminished interest and psychomotor retardation and lack of energy and motivation. However, apathy is more characterized by a lack of motivation, as you all know, without sadness. So there is no mood change, actually, no dysphoria or vegetative, vegetative symptoms. So it's usually derived from insomnia, fatigue, impaired attention of depression. But this is again challenging in patients with Huntington disease because obviously they can have also, for example, insomnia in addition to apatia. And well, this is this constellation of symptoms, apathy, uh, depression, and uh, sleep problems could be very difficult to differentiate. A um, couple of words about neurobiology of apathy in Huntington's disease. There, there is a moderate correlation between brain atrophy and presence of apathy, actually. So it's not uh, the same as, for example, cognitive changes where uh, 
uh, there is an obvious uh, relationship between the brain atrophy and cognitive changes. And when it comes to neurobiological um, underprints of apathy, these points are towards three areas of functional connectivity, actually. These are connections between the basal ganglia and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, orbitomedial prefrontal cortex, and dorsomedial prefrontal cortex. Well, and while well, the most important for the clinician is the treatment of apathy, which uh, unfortunately, um, well, it's uh, very challenging and um, we don't have a lot of uh, therapeutic options here. But as for the general recommendation, it is important, once again, as I mentioned before, uh, differentiate apathy from impaired ability of individual to perform motor or cognitive tasks and, of course, differentiate from depression. Uh, another very important aspect to consider is the reduction of medication. So it could be that the patient actually is experiencing uh, side effects of the medication that we are giving, especially neuroleptics, and um, this can provoke apathy. But remember, of course, that it, there should be a balance between, um, well, the side effects, the apathy, and, uh, well, unfortunately, the abnormal movements that we have to control. So of course, it's, it's very difficult to sometimes to find this balance. Uh, but remember about these side effects. And uh, of course, as I mentioned, uh, when we should remember also about the treatment of coexisting depression that might contribute to apathy. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> when it comes to behavioral recommendations, we should, of course, provide prompts and encouragement of social and physical activities that have been adapted to the individual. So, well, there are a variety of studies, not only when it comes to Huntington disease, but also other neurodegenerative diseases, um, for example, Parkinson's disease, uh, where it has been demonstrated that sports generally or activities, physical activities can improve, obviously, apathy. And finally, pharmacological recommendations. Um, well, <laughs> This is pretty logical that an antidepressants could be the preferred pharmacological option when there is a difficulty differentiating apathy from the depression. Uh, so you should consider a trial of activating antidepressants or even a stimulant drug as pharmacological option for a non-depressed individual. But of course, remember that there sh we should give warning uh, for a potential worsening of irritability and sleep disturbances when prescribing um, this activating antidepressant or stimulant drug. Um, yes, and of course, with apathy, as I mentioned, uh, it's related to depression. Uh, it's very, the most important differential diagnosis is in this case. Uh, depression can precede the onset of motor symptoms, actually, as I mentioned, uh, by many years or even decades. And this is the most common and earliest symptoms prior to the motor onset. This is really a biomarker indeed uh, and clinical marker. And approximately half of people affected with Huntington's disease, they are diagnosed with depression and the most are treated pharmacologically. Uh, and remember so that the prevalence of depression varies across stages of HD. So there is an initial peak of incidence in the early middle manifest stages, followed by gradual reduction toward the later stages. So actually these early stages, these are the period when patients uh, um, experience more depression. Um, well, and the neurobiology of depression in Huntington disease is very complex. As you can see on this diagram, uh, different molecular mechanisms um, probably are involved in this um, in this process. Um, but this uh, causes that gene carriers are more likely to exhibit depressive symptoms than at risk non-carriers, and that the high prevalence of depression may thus be due to neurobiological vulnerability factors in gene carriers interacting with psychological and psychosocial factors. And also depressive symptoms have been correlated with increased functional collectivity and decreased structural collectivity in default mode, net mode network and the basal ganglia. 
Well, and again, the most important again is the treatment. Um, unfortunately, there are no randomized controlled trials that have been conducted to evaluate the treatment of depression in HD. But um, the examination of medication logs in an observational study demonstrated that at least 20% of people uh, at risk of HD took antidepressants. Uh, and of course, the majority of these, they took uh, SSRIs, so selective serotonin reuptake inhib inhibitors, or SNRIs, uh, serotonin, uh, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, um, when, and this has significantly higher than a healthy comparison group. And there is one case series using um, SNRI antidepressant venlafaxine uh, for Oryx in a sample of only 26 individuals with HD and depression, and they reported a significant reduction in depressive symptoms. So, well, it can therefore be concluded that SSRI typically is the first line medication for treatment of depression, and they have only case reports, um, although there are only case reports that support this statement. Well, but it's important that these antidepressants, they can treat also executive dysfunction, as we mentioned, but also irritability and OCD that can coexist in some patients. Um, so at the moment, it seems that it is recommended that standard clinical guidelines for the treatment of depression um, should also be applied for patients with HD. Well, and with depression uh, is related to uh, suicide, suicidality, that is a very um, life-threatening problem in patients with Huntington's disease. And it's pretty common because it's occurred to between seven to 10% of HD patients uh, who had to, uh, attempted suicide. And, um, and prevalence of suicide alienation has been found to vary at different stages again. So for example, 9% in asymptomatic at risk individuals rising to even 22% in pre-diagnostic group. And it seems that there are two critical periods um, with increased suicidal ideation. So when individuals were informed of their proximity to onset of motor symptoms, and then the other critical point is early symptomatic when the level of independence was already compromised. So uh, we can see that there are some turning points. Um, I could say that life-changing events uh, and messages that patients receive that could be depressing and could be leading to suicidal ideation. And there are some risk factors uh, for suicidal attempts and ideation, so which are mainly gender, male gender, disease duration, phase nearing to onset, irritability, impulsivity, depression, obviously, then, but also aggression, anxiety, and obviously also previous suicidal attempts. Uh, well, so here we can conclude that the rationale of suicide may be related to progressive nature of HD. Some suicidal impulses arise due to cognitive impairments. So remember also about these patients. And um, then another important uh, neuropsychiatric symptom is aggression and agitation. We all know that irritability is common in HD and with prevalence that varies between 38 to 73 percent. And the prevalence of aggression is between 22 and 66 percent in majority of studies. So together with impulsivity, irritability, unfortunately can be also misinterpreted uh, by doctors, but also sociologically as antisocial personality disorder. Uh, another important clinical aspect that is that often substance abuse and psychosis may coexist. Um, uh, and also degree of cognitive decline, family history and motor symptoms may uh, lessen misdiagnosis. So a couple of important clinical practice guidelines for agitation in HD for the management of this um, um, comorbidity. So it's important, of course, to identify and treat comorbid medical conditions that can precipitate acute agitation that include infectious, metabolic, toxic, drug-related substance abuse. So all these secondary 
causes that can provoke agitation in a patient. Uh, it is very important also to treat irritability or other coexisting psychiatric symptoms and sleep disturbances because this is uh, also prevention of agitation. Uh, and of course, else, else in other patients with agitation, it is uh, important to modify environmental factors that can contribute to agitation. So uh, include this include not use excessive noises or other overstimulation pain, um, or for example, frequent changes of environment generally are not recommended, as for example, for patients with dementia. So for this is related to behavioral recommendations. So we should, of course, provide these recommendations to carers um, that, well, that can use to um, not to avoid these environmental factors that can indicate that can uh, evoke um, agitation and aggression. But not a treat to self or others, the preferred initial response is to provide safe and quiet space, time to calm down and gentle verbal support. So this is also important. And finally, pharmacological recommendations. So of course, for acute agitation, uh, that is not responsive to these behavioral strategies. The preferred pharmacological options include use of either a benzodiazepine or antipsychotic drug. Uh, for chronic agitations characterized by recurrent and ongoing distress or continuing threat uh, of harm to self of others, pharmacological options include antipsychotic or also mood stabil stabilizing antiepileptic drug. And we should also consider a trial of pain medication when other therapies have failed for agitation in individuals who are unable to verbally communicate cause of distress. Um, and when it comes to anxiety, so anxiety is also pretty frequent in HD, but you can see that different studies have demonstrated different uh, prevalence between 13 and 71%. Uh, and it seems that there is no link with measures of disease progression. And um, logically, anxiety, because this coexists with other mood disorders, um, mainly depression, suicide, irritability, and diminished quality of life, pain, and um, illness beliefs and coping styles. Um, and behaviors such as pacing, chanting, and repetitive tapping may reflect underlying anxiety. As thought processes become less flexible, those with uh, Huntington disease may be anxious by even small departures from routine. So this is also the same as for the agitation that we mentioned. And when it comes to treatment uh, for general recommendation, we again, uh, we should treat coexisting psychiatric symptoms or comorbid medical conditions that can contribute to anxiety and modify environmental factors that can contribute to anxiety. So again, avoid stimulating factors. Um, and this is again, the most important behavioral strategy that we should use. And when it comes to pharmacological recommendations, this is the same actually as for patients with other anxiety with uh, primary anxiety disorder. So SSRIs, the preferred drug option for treatment of anxiety when it occurs either as an isolated symptom or coexisting with depression and OCD, logically, because both depression and OCD are also treated with SSRI. Um, but we should again remember of potential short-term exacerbation of anxiety um, when SSRI is initiated. If this exacerbation occurs, it may be appropriate to add a short-term course or even two weeks um, of benzodiazepines. And well, of course, it's also possible to use alternative serotoninergic drugs such as SSRIs, uh, SNRIs, or chromiplamir, uh, and these are pharmacological options if the initial SSRI is ineffective or not tolerated. Well, another option is the use of omirtazapine, uh, which is a pharmacological option, particularly of coexisting sleep disorder, is present. Um, and we could also, well, if not successful, we can use also antipsychotic uh, as another pharmacological option or uh, clomipramine, um, especially when there is a coexisting uh, obsessive perseverating behaviors. Well, but of course, we know that long term use of benzodiazepines is discouraged uh, in ambulatory individuals with HD 
unless all other uh, options have failed. And finally, very important aspect is, of course, psychosis. Um, studies have actually shown that, again, the rate of psychosis, maybe it's not so high as in other comorbidities, but it's pretty high between 9 to 17 percent. And interestingly enough, psychotic symptoms are more common early in the illness and tend to decrease with cognitive decline. Um, psychotic symptoms in HD tend to be isolated and atypical rather than schizophreniform, with persecutory delusions being the most common. And here, of course, uh, there are some also some important risk, risk factors, such as strong family history of psychosis, psychosis suicide, affective disorders, and motor symptoms. Um, and we should remember here also about some further organic workup. The HD gene has been proposed to potentially lower the threshold for the emergence of schizoph schizophrenia. This is also a very interesting finding. As for clinical practice guidelines for psychosis, so again, for general treatment recommendations, we should identify and treat comorbid, comorbid medical conditions that can precipitate acute onset of psychotic, psychotic symptoms that include, again, variety of secondary causes. We should also treat coexisting psychiatric symptoms of HD, including obsessive perseverative and sleep disorders, and modify uh, external environmental factors. They may contribute to distress of psychotic symptoms. As for the pharmacological recommendation, um, an antipsychotic drug is the first line pharmacological treatment for psychosis in HD, of course. But an alternative antipsychotic should be used when psychotic symptoms have not been adequ uh, adequately controlled by this initial drug. But of course, we do not recommend to exceed the maximum recommended dose of any antipsychotic. But combining antipsychotic drug is discouraged uh, and uh, all reser reserved for, for severe presentations of psychosis in HD. We can also consider a close up in uh, when psychotic symptoms uh, have not been adequately responded with other um, medication, but of course we should remember about uh, intervalled blood testing because of the risk of neutropenia. Um, and of course, uh, uh, last but not least, we should regularly reassess the continued need of antipsychotic because many of the adverse effects that can occur because of the use of these drugs um, can um, can can um, difficult to distinguish from aspects of disease progression. So, coming back, coming to the conclusions, um, it can therefore be concluded that neuropsychiatric symptoms are common in Huntington disease, and they could be prodromal symptoms that occur prior to neurological symptoms and cause significant functional impairment. Um, yes, and here again, this is a summary of stages of Huntington disease at which you can see that also neuropsychiatric um, symptoms occur at early stage. This is very important, therefore, to consider when treating patients both that are presymptomatic but also those at very uh, late stages of Huntington disease. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, here you can see also some pictures of the family members of patients uh, with Huntington disease at the caregivers. Thank you so much.